thank you everyone here at the gallery for the invitation. And I'm super excited to be here with Chloe and with Ksenia, Chloe's first solo show, which mm -hmm. is, I think we can all agree, gorgeous, thank impressive. <laughs> um, so let me introduce Ksenia, Dr. Ksenia Solo. <laughs> so <laughs> <Dr. Pierce. laughs> I am I am not, I'm a dropout. I'm a PhD dropout, I'm ABD. I may or may not exist forever in ABD limbo, but some of us <laughs> just start making shows and then don't finish our dissertation. I'm but you totally finished your dissertation, so I just <laughs> um, Based in New York, you're a um, scholar, an art historian, um, throughout your PhDs from the IFA, right? And, um, and this is a really important dissertation, Fragments, Art, AIDS, and Identity, and Lesbian Identity in the United States. Um, Xenia is a prolific critic and writer. Um, her publication, her works have been published um, in many places, including the Brooklyn Rail, Bomb, Hyperallergic. I'm sure you're working on like five more pieces <laughs> as we speak. Um, she was a curatorial fellow at the Guggenheim, and right now you are a postdoc um, at the New York Historical Society. And Thank you. Chloe, the person we're really here to hear from. <laughs> <laughs> Um, is from Port Neches, Texas, um, has a BS from the University of Texas at Austin, um, and got her MFA at the New York Academy of Art, where she concentrated in painting, um, and was decorated with several fellowships and residencies. Um, she's shown, in addition to New York, in London and in Hong Kong, um, and her work has been featured in a variety of publications. So, excited to be here with you both and with all of you. And um, I wanted to start out with, uh, you know, my own experience of like walking into this exhibition and thinking about um, the first thing that comes to mind is this feels like memory. It feels mm -hmm. kind of like a memorializing, right? Even the, um, even the like, half facade, the kind of like shallowness and yet the sculptural quality of the works makes it feel kind of like a, a freezed memorial, mm -hmm. right? And it made me think about um, an article that I had recently read um, in The New Yorker, which was a feature on the lesbian filmmaker Celine Schiama, who is the um, director of Portrait of a Lady on Fire, who was really insisting in the interview that we are not in a space yet of lesbian history. What we are in is a space of active remembering. So mm -hmm. these memories are still being made. The history is not yet there, right? Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to start the conversation in thinking about this kind of like active place of making mm -hmm. um, in memory and in memorialization and like the different ways in which that touches mm -hmm. these vernaculars. Yeah, so, um... Most of the, the faces that you see like in my figures are from archival photographs um, of just old like secret lesbian bars, gay bars, um, some books that I've read. Um, it's just kind of like a hodgepodge of, of, of pieces that I found. Um, but for me, it felt important to use these figures or these faces in my figures because coming from where I come from, there isn't, I never had the rich history to turn to of, of my past. I didn't know that there was a history for me to even really dive into. Um, there weren't people like me where I was from. Um, pride just existed as a thing. I knew, you know, we had Pride Month, we had a Pride Parade, but it was just, it just was there, it was always there. Um, and then I moved to New York and it's just like this, this overflow of, of just history that I, of, about me, you know, people who are like me that I can turn to and talk to and read about. Um, and that was, it was just a way for me to like really kind of figure out who I was um, in a way that I, I didn't know that I could. Uh, there were all these parts of me that I didn't know really existed until coming here and being surrounded by all of this. Um, so I just kind of like dove into all of it whenever I moved here in my MFA program. Um, and in the beginning, my earlier work like touched on it, but uh, I would say after my MFA program, I really, I really started focusing on the people that came before me that kind of like paved this path for me, this path that I didn't even know that I, I had or would be on one day. Um, 
and, and because of that, it, it's, it feels very, just very important to me, very personal to me because it gave me, it gave me a way to understand myself, uh, these people that I don't know and didn't know existed until moving here. Um, and, I, and so in that way, I wanted to kind of memorialize these people and mm -hmm. honor them, the women that came before me. Um, a lot of them, I don't know who they are. Uh, some of them are, are prominent figures from the past. Others are just from, just from photos that I found, um, just like in my research and searches. Um, mm -hmm. But it did feel really important to me to you know, use them as the people, like though the pieces aren't about who they are, it was important that they are the faces that are representing the figures that I'm, I'm trying to talk about now um, as a version of the past. Thank you. Yeah. So I relate to that. And, um, you know, when I came to New York uh, for grad school, actually, and I wasn't, um, you know, I was interested in feminist American art, mm -hmm. but I, I never studied queer art. Um, I didn't know much about the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just became obsessed with this period yeah. in, um, in American history uh, in the early 80s through through the you know late 90s, mm -hmm. which of course the AIDS crisis is still ongoing, but but that was uh, what I focused on in the dissertation, and I thought, oh, I'm gonna uh, you know I'm gonna reconstruct this history. I'm gonna provide this comprehensive narrative of uh, the lesbian history of the mm -hmm. AIDS crisis, and I'm gonna take all these fragments and, and put them together and have this survey. Um, and what happened is that I wrote a dissertation and I took a look at it and I thought, these are still fragments. Yeah. Mm. Um, and I titled the dissertation Fragments, mm -hmm. Art, AIDS, and Lesbian Identity in the United States. And, and I think that there's something really meaningful um, in thinking about the ways in which reconstructing something or pre providing a comprehensive narrative doesn't necessarily have to result in a whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there is a meaningfulness to fragments and mm -hmm. fragmentation. And I think that mm -hmm. I, I see that in your work because you are taking, you know, aspects of your own history, mm -hmm. fragments from archives, right. uh, and you're putting these fragments together yeah. without necessarily insisting on on a whole. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of insisting that the fragmentation is whole. It's not fragmented. Mm -hmm. And that was actually a path in your work formally, mm -hmm. right? Because yeah. we've talked about how, I mean, the, the works are, you know, of a whole, but they're also like pieced together right. from fragments. And that is like very clear. They have something of like the theater set where the theater set is not pretending mm -hmm. to like be an illusion. Exactly. Um, but also earlier in your practice, mm -hmm. you were really leaning into the fragment. Yeah, right? yeah. My earlier work it was a uh, fragmented portraiture. It was it was really about the self and identity, and, it, and that was that was really when I, I was focused on figuring myself out. Um, so I don't, you know, some of you might know my earlier work, but it was I would say akin to uh, Nathaniel Mary Quinn in terms of fragmentation in the in the face. Um, and then whenever I started, kind of like you know as any artist does, going down another path, um, became less about this, just a soul person's identity and more about these spaces that these people or these figures exist in. So the fragmentation kind of started to find its way into uh, you know, different time periods and different places, contrasting where I am now and places like where I'm from in Port Natchez, Texas. Um, but yeah, you know, I wanted to keep the fragmentation because I do feel like that's a really that's a really valuable way of making it uh, for queer artists. I think that, I, and I think of a, a lot of contemporary queer artists now work in fragmentation in some yeah, way or another. Absolutely. And that's for a reason. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's for a reason. Um, and not, you know, that's, that goes back far. Um, and, and it remains now because it is still a very like radical language. Um, so I didn't want to lose that. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was finding a way to kind of, you know, so that the compositions like in themselves aesthetically remained balanced. Um, but also it held that that content or like the meaning of what is fragmentation and what is whole. Mm -hmm. And in terms of lesbian history specifically, also like Sappho exists in fragments. Yeah, you know? right. Like how far back right. can you go yeah. in lesbian history, <laughs> Sappho? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Which makes space then mm -hmm. for the contemporary, for like every generation's reading and the yeah, multiple yeah. readings within generations between mm -hmm. those fragments. Mm -hmm. 
I love that we're in front of the photo booth mm -hmm. piece because this is such an incredibly rich piece to look at and talk about. Um, and part of that is like has to do with what we're talking about now is like this kind of like snapshot of a moment in time. Right. That is, you know, the result of like this being this, you know, safe momentary space yeah. where you could actually be intimate with someone where it was private. Mm -hmm. It's like not a bathroom, which is also another really important place in yeah. <laughs> your history. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but also to, you know, to think about it as a space that, you know, to like lean on the one hand to, um, uh, that's analogous to a religious space, mm -hmm. right? The photo booth as a confessional, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is the comparison that you've made. Mm -hmm. um, and also something where uh, something is like then revealed, right? right? There's like evidence of something we think about photography as at least in like lay person's terms as like being a kind of truth. Whereas the longer you spend in graduate school, you're like photo photography has never told the truth. Right. It's always only lied. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, thinking about those like pieces of evidence and like the the blurring mm -hmm. of the photo strips mm -hmm. um, is really interesting in that context because they are fragments, but they're also like symbols of themselves. Yeah, right. It's not as it's, it's photography has become in your work not something like indexical, but something iconic. Right. It signifies something yeah. else. Yeah, and I think the iconic, the you know, leaning into what the iconic is, uh, does come from you know my Catholic upbringing. Um, this piece specifically, though, um, I was thinking about the Catholic confessional, um, a place that holds your secrets, um, though like you know fundamentally very different. The photo booth and the Catholic confessional, um, it is still this very tight and narrow space that you're you know trying to fit your body into. And with my figures, I wanted it to feel like they were still too large to fit into this space. Um, but kind of still being a, a safe space, but also private but public. Um, because I do think a lot about how in the queer community and, and be just a queer existence, period, um, pr our privacy, like our private moments or moments that aren't necessarily, don't need to be private are, are very, very public. Um, I walk down the street trying to hold my partner's hand and we're both aware of if we're walking through a group of men that maybe feel like they have like a weird energy going on or one street we feel safe on and the next we don't. Um, so the idea of like what is private and what is public for a queer person. Mm. Um, and I do have, there is a photo booth back in Texas. It was one of my uh, favorite bars to go to. And the photo booth actually had uh, a screen on the outside that showed what was happening on the inside. And I've, I've never seen that anywhere else. Mm. Um, and maybe it's an anomaly, but uh, I always thought that was fascinating. And so I wanted to like kind of like reclaim that and like, you know, get this video of uh, friends of mine and just like showing them, you know, like using it with love and um, privacy kind of. Um, but yeah, you know, it was it was just kind of a play on what is private, what is public. And, um, you know, the, the photo booth also like the red curtain, similar to a Catholic confessional um, and also just kind of having like a means of quick escape if necessary. Mm. Um, but yeah. And not just this piece, but but your other pieces as well, religion seems to be a running thread mm -hmm. through the work. Like there's the Christ tattoo. Yeah. And then even this, uh, it's almost like a halo. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there is, there is a, I don't know if I would call it a trend, but there, there is a history of queer artists um, using religion and Christ in particular mm -hmm. as a metaphor for queer martyrdom, right? right. And uh, throughout the history of art, when, when Christ is feminized, he's feminized because he is in pain. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. pain is an effeminate feeling, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, could you speak to that? Is that something that you, uh, you know, from a very personal perspective I don't know how yeah, Catholic no um, to be honest how Catholic I, is Catholic well uh you know I like like I was telling you the other night um I've I've uh blocked a lot of it out I actually don't think I don't think of Christ being in pain whenever I'm making this work I, that's mm. I'm gonna think about that now that's fascinating to hear um when I'm thinking about Christ in my work you know if I put you know like the Christ tattoo on the hands or the the cross earring for me that's just kind of like that that framework is always there. Like it's never gonna go away. It shaped me, it's in me. Um, I do consider myself a spiritual person. I don't consider myself a religious person. Um, but just kind of how that was always 
hung over my head in trying to be myself. Um, you know, like, don't be too gay. Think about this. It's still a sin. Like, these are all things that I was told um, and that I still think about whether I, whether those people think that now or not. Um, but, you know, specifically in the, the hands piece, which is titled The Eyes of Texas, um, those are, that's actually me and my partner's hands. And um, I placed that, you know, as you can see, I don't have that tattoo, but I placed that tattoo on my hand because I wanted the piece to be about just the, the context of queer, of hand holding in a queer context. Um, mm -hmm. And I wanted this, the culture of the, of tattoos and like jewelry and all this stuff is like a part of lesbian culture uh, that I've always been around. And specifically like placing that tattoo to where his eyes were hidden behind um, the bracelet. Mm -hmm. So you can see that he's kind of looking up. It almost looks like he's crying, but it's really like blood from the thorn, from the, um, the thorns. And just kind of like, you know, it, it, maybe it's, Maybe he's offering security, maybe, maybe he's offering judgment. You know, this person felt comfortable mm -hmm. getting that tattoo, right? So yeah, that's obviously something like close to their heart and that they believe in, but it's this contradiction that exists there always of like, you know, it, is this okay, is it not? Like, are the hands reaching for each other or for each other? Or are they pulling away from each other? Um, but I wanted it to be, I wanted him to be a part of it. Uh, and I titled it The Eyes of Texas based on the, the UT fight song, which is called The Eyes of Texas and the song, it's a long song, but the starting lyrics are the eyes of Texas are upon you. you all the live long day, the eyes of Texas are upon you. You cannot get away. Terrifying. And um, the tune of it, so, so scary. Um, the tune of it is also based on working on the railroad. Um, so a very problematic song all around. Um, and I thought of, you know, the eyes of Texas as uh, Christ's eyes for me um, and for all of Texas. So, yeah. Why do you think you... Um you made it permanent in a piece, but you but would not never get the tattoo. Okay, that's just the, we talked about that. That is, um, permanent scares me. Just, that's just a fact about me. Um, I used to want like, like a full sleeve. Your partner is smiling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, my partner has tattoos. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I used to want like, for aesthetic reasons, a full sleeve. I, you know, I, I didn't care if it meant anything to me. I just thought it'd look cool. Uh, and then as I got older, it became about, well, you know, I, I, I don't know, it's something that's be really important to me for me to put it on my body just because it freaks me out. Like, what if I don't want it in two years? I'm a very mm -hmm. indecisive person. So, mm -hmm. but yeah. There's, um, I completely lost my train of thought, but, um, yeah, thinking about the icon, mm -hmm. thinking about this um, this conversation about you know Catholicism being something that is like a you know a negative influence, but also like makes you who you are, right? Because it has their it has its indelible imprint mm -hmm. on a person, and also thinking about like what you know there's a there's also a kind of like welcoming and acceptance of this iconography mm -hmm. into um, into the work in kind of a human sense yeah. too. It's like, no, I'm like not only friends with like, you know, atheist dykes who like have like yeah. the correct worldview. Right, right. right. Kind of accepting the reality of the fact that like, you know, from what I understand about Texas, it's like you can go to the gay church and you can go to the a little bit conservative church and you can go to like the fundamentalist church, but everyone kind of goes to church. Right? Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, exactly. Everyone just kind of ends up at church. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, even if you're young and you don't like know what you're doing or necessarily believe in that, you you go to church. Yeah, mm -hmm. you just find a better church. Anyway, yeah, right. And yeah. so like this idea that like yeah, like there are there are ways in which like. Um, like belief paths can like mingle and coexist yes. and also be flexible and also thinking about like Catholic doctrine. I went to Catholic, not Catholic, but went to Catholic school mm -hmm. for 12 years. You did? And I did. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's kind of what happens. You grow up in Brooklyn. Somehow you like wind up in a parochial school <laughs> and then like 12 years later, you're like, wow, like at least I know what's going on in like Renaissance art history class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but also, like, there are, you know, to, like, think about Catholicism, something like Catholicism as a monolith is also to, like, ignore the, like, lived experience of folks globally mm -hmm. who are, um, who are, like, upholding and living mm -hmm. ways of experiencing religion in, like, completely queer ways mm -hmm. that are, you know, that very much exist. 
Um, yeah. We have a show coming up at Leslie Lohman, organized by um, the artist and uh, wonderful writer Nicholas Dumit de Espejo, mm -hmm. um, called Indecencia, mm -hmm. and thinks about, takes at its departure point the theology of Marcella Altaus Reed, who is a theologian from Argentina who taught for years in Scotland and published books, including one called The Queer God, and was thinking about like how you vernacularize theology, like mm -hmm. where does liberation theology with its like socialist tendencies and major acceptance, like where are those limitations and how can you push past those mm -hmm. limitations? And I feel like in some ways your work lets us see that right yeah, there's yeah. a line in one of Marcella's books that's like you know what happens when you like bring the rosary to the lesbian bar which right, is the line that yeah, I thought of yeah. when I saw the rosary hanging from that bar mm -hmm, piece mm -hmm. yeah you know my my relationship with Catholicism but also just not even Catholicism just with uh Christ and God is that you know that exists like I was, you know, I was telling you, I, when I say I'm spiritual, like there are days where I'm like, I believe in Jesus Christ. Like I do. And I believe in God. There are days when I think God is just mother earth, the universe talking to me. It's not, I just, I just really believe that it's a feeling. And I believe that whatever, whatever that energy is, it just, it loves everyone and it's there for everyone. And I identify that with like the cross because that's what I was raised with. So when I'm bringing this into these pieces, you know, sometimes it is to say, oh, this isn't, you know, maybe these people aren't accepted with this, but they're like challenging it anyways. And other times it is just, they they feel comfortable in that religion and in that belief in spirituality. So um, it does go back and forth, but yeah, I do I do think of it as a, just like an all encompassing like love, even if, even if in some instances, like, you know, with the hands, it feels a little bit like grittier, I guess. Mm -hmm. I think this is something that I really appreciated about seeing your show, uh, and I was not familiar with your work before. And I walked in and I thought, or actually, I first I saw the images online. Um, and I thought, this is very American. I have never yeah. been to Texas, but this feels very Texas. And it's very <laughs> Americana. Yeah. And it made me think of Thomas Hart Benton mm -hmm. and the regionalist and, mm -hmm. and the great American muralist tradition, which was so white and straight, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. And of course there are people like Paul Cadmus who were completely censored and, and, and ignored. Um, I mean, had some career, but anyway, but you know, American muralism really set the stage for, for abstract expressionism, which mm -hmm. then became the like most macho movement, mm -hmm, yeah. right? And this is, and there are very few queer artists uh, and in particularly lesbian artists who who work in abstract expressionism, mm -hmm. um, which is why I appreciate Louis Fishman so much. Mm -hmm. um, because there is, I mean, it makes sense, right? It, it, the, the same with feminism. There is a desire to work in a medium and, and, and an aesthetic, aesthetic strategy that, that moves away from the tradition set by right. men, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is how feminists started working in installation art and video, et cetera, because mm -hmm. they didn't want to work in painting and sculpture. Right, right. Um, and so I think that it is very, um, I don't like using the word brave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's also strategic. Yeah. Yeah. In some ways, right? Yes. Even if it's not, and you know, we can also talk about like strategies not definitely coming from like, I want to make figurative works because right. this pantheon of people and I want to subvert this and that, yeah. but also like thinking through on like a more subconscious level, things that communicate, right? Like, mm -hmm. thank you for bringing up American regionalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because I also thought about that as I looked at this work mm -hmm. and also that, you know, at the, at its height, um, and of course, it's like macho aggressiveness really had to be held up mm -hmm. in a way that it was like, doth you, thou doth protest too much. Um, and thinking about like Grant Wood, for example, being like a closeted. Yeah, I was just gonna say <laughs> closeted yeah. homosexual, mm -hmm. right? Who was like, you know, like yeah. took it to the grave. Yeah. Um, and Thomas Hartman, you know, like being like rejected essentially from his family, but for being an artist, which was mm -hmm. like too effeminate a career and, comp yeah. and like overcompensated and has like completely 
edible, ed edible way by trying to make the most macho art possible. Yeah, and really <laughs> shit it on gay people. And was like, a really virulent homophobe. So outspoken, Terrible. homophobic, horrible. Yeah, and but also like thinking through those strategies and thinking about like it, that was a populist movement. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. um, and it's and it's this kind of clarity mm -hmm. that feels important to you mm -hmm. too. Like in one, in our conversation mm -hmm. yesterday, you were talking about like, well, you know, I, you know, these works are larger than life mm -hmm. for a reason, um, and you think about the possibility of them potentially making someone uncomfortable. Yeah. Right? Which then presupposes the fact that someone is coming in to look at them that probably doesn't know anything about contemporary art. Right. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting that you brought up uh, Benton's dad as a, you know, someone who was like, it's, it's too feminine. Like, don't, you know, don't do that. And so in response to that, he made these huge, very macho murals. And like, I can relate to that because I have one of my family members um, just kind of gives me the same energy of uh, just um, a lack of belief. I'll just leave it at that. Mm -hmm. um, and so coming here, it, you know, it's, it's, someone brought up recently, oh, everything's bigger in Texas. Like, is that what you're doing? And it's like, no, <laughs> but like at the same time, like there is that, that, that like beat your chest energy that's instilled in everyone growing. It's just there. You cannot, yeah. you can't escape it, you know? Um, and that was like what I was taught growing up. But then what was cool was what happened was when I came here, that lessened, but it became a little bit more aggressive than thinking of this said person kind of like, you know, like saying like, mm -hmm. mm, I don't, you know, I don't think art is it. Like art isn't worth it. Um, and so originally, you know, starting to make the big work was that, was like kind of like a, a fire in me, like it, I was angry. Um, and then it turned into, well, like why? Like, what can I do with this? Like, wh where can I, chan what can I channel this into? Like, mm -hmm. what's the reason for it? And it's, I, I want these, I want these figures to take up the space. I want them to take up the space the same way that people like this person do. Um, and for the, these pieces to make people like that feel uncomfortable in the same way that those people make people like us feel uncomfortable. Um, so I do want it to feel like when you're walking into a space of these pieces, you are walking into their space and they hold the space. You're not, depending on who you are, you might not be welcome, but you know, you're here. And um, I do want there to be a level of discomfort in the, the large, like the, the size of the figures and the pieces mm -hmm. as a whole. And of course there's an important history of figuration in queer art. Yeah. And it's making a comeback. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But I, I'm interested whether uh, you've, I mean, this is your first solo exhibition. Mm -hmm. So this work has not been exhibited in Texas yet. Uh, I did the Dallas Art Fair. Okay. But not, you know, that's the extent. Yeah. yeah. Because it's also, you know, the, the audience that comes through here is so different from the audience. Well, they yeah, they just work. generally agree. Yeah. <laughs> right. In Texas, it's yeah. like, you know, this is... Uh, it's not so coded, mm -mm. Um, but. Do you have fantasies about public art? <laughs> I can totally see that happening for me one day. In oh, Texas. that would be, yes, absolutely. I would love that. It was probably, you know, well in the future, but it has crossed my mind. You know, it's like, how do you, once you start working big, it's kind of hard to, yeah. where do you stop? <laughs> but also your, your interest in this, public versus private, right? We were yeah. talking earlier about there is, um, there has been in the last decade, this uh, obsession within the queer artist community mm -hmm. with the disappearance of lesbian bars. Mm -hmm. uh, I know like between us, we know like 10 artists doing projects about on the that, disappearance right. of lesbian bars. Um, but it is primarily in New York that the bars are disappearing. Well, right? that's primarily where I they existed there. also. Yes, yeah. um, but it, it, there is this, um, I guess there's this misconception that because the lesbian bars are disappearing, the lesbian is disappearing, mm -hmm. right? Which is, I would argue, not the case. Mm -hmm. um, what has happened is that, you know, there are more spaces that um, welcome mm -hmm. people of all genders and, and sexual identities. Um, and so I think that this insistence on you know, this, this urge against the disappearing, disappearance of lesbian bars is also um, a move against assimilation, 
right? Mm -hmm. And an insistence that our identity, that otherness is an inherent part of our identity. Mm -hmm. And so that there, that there need to be spaces where we remain private, right? right. And where yeah. there is a certain anonymity, et cetera. Um, while, you know, you can make out as a lesbian couple in, in most bars in mm -hmm. New York City and nobody will, will right. bat an yeah. eye, right? Yeah. Um, but there is something to be, to be said for that and, and for this nostalgia, mm -hmm. um, this nostalgia for a secrecy. Yeah. And yeah. I don't mean to imply that um, I think that queer identity and, you know, young people coming out as queer today and all, older people coming out as queer today, that this experience still needs to be marked by shame and secrecy mm -hmm. uh, and, and violence. But I myself, as a bitter, grumpy lesbian, <laughs> uh, I do, I do want, want it to be remembered that all those darker aspects mm. are part of queer history, that queer mm. history is rooted in shame and violence and secrecy. Right. And I identify with a nostalgia for that. Mm -hmm. um, whenever I teach queer history, I always assign this one essay by Sharon Marcus, who teaches at Columbia. And in response to the proliferation of, of queerness, queer as a term, she argues that you know, if everyone queer is queer, then no one is. And while yeah. that's exactly the point that queer, the queer theorists intend to make, it also obscures why somebody like Seiki Agan and Brendan Tina were murdered for being queer, right. you know? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot to say mm -hmm. there. Yeah, there's that tension between nostalgia, certain kinds of nostalgia, yeah. how nostalgia operates in a kitsch sense, mm -hmm. how, you know, nostalgia operates in a sense of like young or older people finding mm -hmm. identity mm -hmm. and also how it, um, how it interacts with memory yeah. and memorialization, right? Because they're not the same thing. They're mm -hmm. entangled, but they're not the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so what does it mean to like hold something up as a way of remembering mm -hmm. and also to like think about how nostalgia operates in like projecting the present onto right. the past yeah yeah but yeah i think there is that that like desire still for a lot of the queer community to you know it's like we want this right we, we want we want the general acceptance and to be able to go and make out in any bar that we want to and it'd be okay you know and we can do that in new york but be, because we do come from that um and you know me thinking about places like home where i, I couldn't make out with my partner in a bar and feel like it was okay um there's, you want that like community. You want, you want that private, sacred, it's, just, it's sacred, uh, that sacred space that you can exist with like your people mm -hmm. in. Um, and I think that that is a part of the queer and lesbian identity is, is the kind of the struggle and the secrecy that we come from. And yeah, yeah like holding on to that a little bit. And also the question of what makes a safe space, right? So, right. so for me, it's great to be in a space where everybody is queer friendly, mm -hmm. but it's even better to be in a space where everybody else is queer. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's a, like additional layer of, of safety. Yeah. You know, and I've, you know, I've actually tried to have this conversation with uh, like family members of mine and it's, it's hard for them to understand like, why I would rather hang out with like my, my queer friends over my straight friend, like a big group of them. And it's like, not because I like them more and not the other ones more. <laughs> it's literally just, it's, there's just this unspoken, like, sameness, you know, like, just comfort and overall safety there that you can't, I feel like you can only understand if you come from, you know, a, a, an other community, a marginalized mm -hmm. community. Yeah. Yeah. I would love to know, actually, how you arrived at the title of the show. Mm. Um, I listen is. to, so I actually, I get a lot of my titles from um, music that I'm listening to while I'm making the pieces, mm -hmm. um, or just favorite songs of mine or something from the past. Um, the title of the show is a title of a song that I was listening to while I was making the show, or like certain pieces, um, and Fast Hearts and Slow Towns just kind of felt to me like 
it's like thinking of racing hearts, like the anxiety if you're trying to like get away with something or like have an intimate moment in a place that you're not allowed to or it's not safe mm-hmm. to. Um, and slow towns just being a, a small town that isn't accepting of that or okay with that. Um, that could also be interpreted as slow towns, meaning like slow minded maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, fast hearts being, you know, maybe not just the anxiety, but the excitement and the happiness there. Um, but I liked, I liked those two together. Yeah. And, you know, and it was, this was very much based on like me thinking about home specifically and that kind of like pleasure and like fear happening mm-hmm. with queer intimacy in the public slash not so public sp- or private spaces. It also sounds like a film in some ways. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and these I, are almost okay. stills. Like yeah. a road trip. Film this time. Yeah. <laughs> like a road trip film. There's, yeah. a, there's a term for road trip films. Uh, road um, movies. Road movies? Yeah. Really? That's the term? In a way, the show feels like a road movie. Okay. Yeah. Well, I also love, you know, like cinematic and stuff like that. Like I look, I, mm-hmm. I watch, I feel like a lot of preparation for me is I read a lot uh, and I watch a lot of films. Um, and they also feel like stills to me. Um, they also kind of feel like, you know, when I'm thinking about the, um, the piece with the two women in the truck, like that feels like a love story that I maybe like doodled on the side of my paper when I was young and then like mm-hmm. hid it under my mattress or something like that. Um, but so they feel like, like moments that have like frozen in time. Yeah. Um, I don't, you know, it's rare that I use movement in my pieces because mm-hmm. it's like, I want to focus on like this one moment. Yeah. I have another question. Unless yeah. you want would you say that all the characters presented here are women? Because well, I always say that lesbian comes in many genders. And, yeah. Um, I think that um, you know many of these actually read as non-binary. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, I usually, a lot of times, I see them as non-binary, like very androgynous figures. If I know the person that I'm using, um, I know how they identified. That's when I start saying women or girls or whatever. Um, and a lot of times it is just like tailored to the conversation who I'm speaking to, how they see the, the figures. And I'll mm-hmm. kind of like lean into that. If they call them women, I go with that. If I, I usually don't mm-hmm. go with it. If someone calls them men, which has happened before, I, I shut that down. Um, I was called sir the other day. On yeah, day. yeah. That's a, it's been a long time thing. since that's happened to me, but it, it did. Um, <laughs> No, but I, I would say, yeah, you know, if I, if I were to like just fully say like these are my made up characters, they're all non-binary. They can be they, them, he, she, she, her, what, you know, whatever. Um, because, you know, truthfully, it's like, I don't know. Like a lot of these people come from pictures that mm-hmm. they were the person in the back in the picture. They weren't, you know, titled. They weren't the, the subject. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know who they felt they were, yeah. who they were. So, yeah. I've been accused of uh, anachronizing anachronisms uh, quite a few times, you know, a- a- applying the term queer uh, mm-hmm. to artists that that lived in a time when, you know, the term queer didn't mm-hmm. exist in the, right. the same way that it did today. And but, you know, because we didn't have the language it doesn't mean that the identity didn't right. exist. Mm-hmm. Right. And and that's the thing with lesbian identity as well, that you know, many people who identified as lesbian mm-hmm. uh, in the 80s or 90s now identify as non-binary yeah. or trans right. or, or, or trans and lesbian. You know, mm-hmm. all these identities right. mm-hmm. can exist alongside each other. Yeah. Queer mm-hmm. doesn't negate gay, lesbian, trans, mm-hmm. bisexual. Totally. Um, and, and how do they build on each other? Mm-hmm. And how do they strengthen each other? And also, how do they actually, in some cases, weaken each other? And what are the challenges? And that's the other thing, right? We didn't always get along. Um, there are dark aspects of queer history. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm slightly allergic to Pride Month. <laughs> <laughs> Happy Pride. Um, because, you know, it's so much about celebration. Um, but before the party, there was the riot. Right. It's, and, yeah. Uh, There's that like lack, almost lack of acknowledgement of, yeah. of how it started, what it mm-hmm. what it was in the beginning. And it's still a riot in many places, mm-hmm. like yeah. Texas. Yeah. Yeah, and not any kind of long arc toward justice. Mm-hmm. Instead, rapidly devolving. Yes. In ways that maybe even the most cynical among us didn't see coming. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's on a happier note. (laughs) (laughs) Um, This is a terrible question to ask. Oh, God. In a talk. Oh, no. (laughs) Okay. Um, 
but also like what are you know often in making work or in doing writing which mm -hmm. the two of us do it's like you kind of gain a clearer picture of what you might like to do next or like oh. what what might feel like something that you might want to attempt or yeah. something that's opened up for you have there things that what's opened up for you in this process of making um great question I really want to lean, I want to explore installation more. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, uh, in my next show, I'm potentially going to actually create a space. Mm -hmm. um, the layout of the gallery is, they have a, a main gallery and then a smaller gallery on the side, and I'm using both of them. And so I might use gallery two as like a space, as an exploratory space. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm thinking of, you know, like, for instance, I made this photo booth, pretend the photo booth is actually like a fully three-dimensional thing. So. Um, stuff like that. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of what this show I feel like opened for me. Um, mm -hmm. I would say especially this piece behind you mm -hmm. and um, the hands piece, the eyes of Texas in the other yeah. room. You know, it was kind of those felt like these felt like the most zoomed in for me almost mm -hmm. and more um, yeah. with this one, especially more installation based, I guess I would say the same with the bar. Um, so I think I'll just continue kind of like bringing it out from the wall mm -hmm. almost and just like seeing what I can do. Uh, in that way, and also maybe potentially not so reliant on the figure in some works. Yeah, yeah. so like leaning into um, the absence of the person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just and please don't reconstruct the lesbian part. Well, no, I'm not. Say, no, I'm not going to do that. A beautiful indicator that that will not happen. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're not going to be like pinning. Right. Putting photo strips to the wall, yeah, but no. instead, I think that like whatever this environment becomes, will recognize that we are not in like an imagined, reconstructed place where we can like squint our eyes and like pretend we're you know yes either in Texas or in some other part of the U.S. Right. in the '60s, right, right in the right. first Stonewall days, but instead like a kind of ongoing consciousness of like what it is you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just coming more into the the viewer space, a little bit more immersive, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Oh, um, I would love to open it up yeah. to all of you. Um, it, from idea wise to the end, um, idea wise to the end, five months. Wow. That's oh, wow. gnarly. Amazing. It's months. a lot of work. That wasn't like, oh, I'm just casually working. That was like a hustle. Wow. I didn't know that. Well, the, w the reason that it happened that way, um, I knew about the show well in advance. Um, I was in a 450 square foot studio and I had two very large pieces that were taking up two of my three walls that uh, collectors had purchased for me, but I had not made yet. So I had to spend uh, a month or two finishing those and getting them out so that I could start on this body of work. So by the time I got them out, it was early December. So I spent the month of December coming up with the pieces. So the way that I work is I make the mock-ups and I do a lot of reading. Um, the mock-ups are done in Photoshop and then I plan the, the build of them. Um, and then, so January, early January is whenever I started actually constructing the pieces. Um, yeah. That's my birthday. Five months. January 1st? Early January. Early January is your birthday? I slip in my birthday every chance okay. I get. <laughs> so yeah, it was a, it's a rough <laughs> last like seven months totally. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Did you have like a studio routine when you first get in here? Did I have a what? Like a studio routine when you were in the studio and now like get in the What are your productivity secrets? Exactly. What time do you wake up? <laughs> well, oh, well, that's always different. It depends on when I go to sleep. But um Depending on when I get there, uh, I usually make a pot of coffee. I drink the whole pot of coffee. Um, <laughs> I will catch up on emails and stuff like that or do some like touch-ups on mock-ups if I need to, like depending on what phase of the process I'm in. Usually if I'm in like the building part of it, then I spend some time on my computer, like, you know, making sure everything's in order and then I'll get to work. If I'm painting, um, I'll just drink the coffee and just start working immediately. I usually, I don't, I'm not good at like, uh, taking breaks and like relaxing. Like if I'm, if I'm at the studio, I'm there to work. So I know that this is a question that comes up often about ears um, and the mm -hmm. books on ears in your work. <laughs> um, so we're, we're doing this question together. Okay. <laughs> really like ears as shape, 
Yeah. Um, but the other thing, can we, I'm curious to know what they might symbolize for you, because of course, I think of listening. Yeah, of course. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of the um, signs of care. Yeah, so, yeah. So, please. Yeah, so um, originally when I first started incorporating the ear, I was also, that was when I was doing the very fragmented portraits. Um, so it was like weird noses, weird ears, all these really enlarged things. I really just fell in love with painting the ear. Um, and then it turned into, okay, like, you know, it, and it was, in that piece, the specific piece, it was about listening. I used that ear from a specific person to talk about what it, you know, like hearing and listening. Um, it is not necessarily about that anymore. Um, it has just become this like love for painting ears. I think that they're fun and weird and quirky and they're very unique to the person. Uh, they, they're like a fingerprint. Um, and then me and Sam Martina were actually talking and um, she brought up orientation um, and how ear, our ears are how, and our hearing is how we orient ourselves in the world. And so that's something I'm gonna really start thinking about because I actually started reading a book by uh, Sarah Ahmad, Help Me Jack, what was the title of that book? Uh, queer, phenomenology. queer Phenomenology, which is all about uh, orientation, queer orientation, um, physical and, you know, sexuality, uh, which is fascinating. And so, you know, I might derive something from that for them, but up to this point, it has just been like a way to kind of add in this like quirkiness and like monstrous feel to them. Because as I leaned away from the fragmented portraiture and leaned into the fragmented like overall spaces, it felt like the figures could not be so fragmented themselves. Like the faces couldn't be so much of just a cluster of things. Um, but that was the one thing that I held on to because it's, it was like, okay, like even if the figures look a little bit cohesive, um, there's at least that part on the face that is like, no, this is something still like going on. Something's like not, it's not right. It's a little off, so. I will add to that, it's actually, not surprisingly, one of my favorite books, um, Sarah Ahmed's Queer Phenomenology, and she argues that we become oriented through the experience of disorientation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, and yeah. that is so, like, that, that detail mm -hmm. is so meaningful. Yeah. These are all great questions. Everyone's doing amazing. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Everyone's doing amazing. I love that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Well, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.